Welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel, and I'm joined by our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Good to see you. Good to see you. Have you been diving at all? Um, not not this week, but I, I did go snorkeling yesterday in the river. I, I saw um, some pictures so of that. Nice. That was t yeah. pictures taken by your daughter, no less. Yes, yeah. I collected her from school, and we went to take the dog for a walk at the river. And I, we took our wetsuits down there. Um, no fins, just 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 enough to put our heads underwater. Splendid. Well, she doesn't have a she had, doesn't put her head underwater yet, but yeah, it was good fun. <laughs> Sounded looked like it. Um, so today, what uh, we thought we might discuss, or what what I was going to ask Alex was, um, Alex has been to the Red Sea many 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 times, um, and to the Egyptian Red Sea many many times, and um, whilst he's there, he's captured some amazingly iconic pictures of. Um, Oceanic white tip sharks. So um, I thought that it would be a good opportunity to pick his brains on um, get his um, to get his top tips on how to capture pictures of oceanic white tip sharks. So there you are, Alex. That's your question. How do we go about doing this then? Well, I think it's something something that resonates really strongly with European divers because I think for a lot of European divers, the Red Sea is is one of their first tropical destinations. It's one of their most popular tropical or warm water destinations. And it's usually the first place people encounter, you know, proper non-reef sharks. Mm. And the oceanic white tip is, is the first one. And I think they're particularly memorable because they, they don't really behave like, like a lot of, of sharks. Most reef sharks tend to be pretty wary of divers. Certainly, you know, they'll come into to good viewing range, but they don't usually come that, that freely into photographic range. Yeah. Whereas oceanic white tips, like, like most pelagic sharks, they're scavenging sharks. They need to investigate anything they find in their basically empty pelagic realm yep. to see if it's a potential food source. Yep. So they give the opportunity for very close encounters without the need for any bait. And, and um, I've never dived in the Red Sea with using bait for them. Yet they give the opportunity for close encounters and really strong images, which I think is, is something that is, is really nice. I think that's... Um, that's I think they're also... Sorry. That's, it's worth pointing out that the majority of, of images of sharks globally um, are captured using bait. So this is quite a unique mm -hmm. thing, really, that, that, that in the Red Sea, um, the authorities are, are very anti-baiting. Um, they try and prevent it as much as possible. Um, so um, so the images we've seen from the Red Sea are, in that, from that instance, certainly very unique. Sorry, Alex, you were saying. No, no, it's a really important point to stress because also... There are, you know, a number of photographers out there who don't feel comfortable with with baited dives, mm. whether that's, yeah, you know, from, from a safety point of view or perhaps from a, you know, from an ethical point of view. It's yeah. just not something they they particularly agree with. And I think oceanic white tips do give everyone who, you know, whatever your sort of feelings on these things, the chance for the, those encounters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think it's a really they're a really important shark to photograph and tell the story of because they have become one of the most persecuted sharks out there, mm. certainly in terms of total population numbers. I mean, there's, they were, you know, as, you know, certainly during the Second World War, they were so numerous across so much of the, the warmer oceans of the world mm. that, you know, they were, you know, actually a real hazard for, for you know, during naval battles and things when, when people, when, you know, ships sank and people went into the water. The oceanic white tips were a real, real, real issue in those situations. Yep. Um, and since that, you know, in that sort of intervening 80 years or so, their numbers have, have gone to the point that they're almost impossible to see all around the world for, yep. for divers and underwater photographers. So, yep. you know, one of the largest, or one of the world's most numerous large predators has just been wiped out in the lifetime of many people. Yeah. And I think, you know, the fact that we get the chance to see them in a few places reliably is something to celebrate. Yeah. But it's also, you know, we have to sort of cut that with the fact that actually people are able to see them where, everywhere they want to. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, for me, there's kind of, there's two places you can see them reliably. Um, the Egyptian Red Sea and the offshore reefs there, which we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, and I'll come back into that in detail. I, I think also in the far east, Eastern Bahamas, particularly around Cat, Cat Island, Island yeah. they, have, they have reliable oceanics, but only usually in that kind of April, May, early June window. It's a pretty short window during the year. You do run into them in other places around the world doing pelagic dives, diving out in the blue. You know, they are still, you know, remnants of populations around, but they're not the, in the hugely numerous numbers they once were. And there's nowhere else really reliably. Sometimes in Hawaii, they see them, you know, with some reliability. 
I know people have done, you know, pelagic dives all around the world and, and run into them um, after dives. But the Red Sea for me is a place that you really can see them reliably and you can see them reliably without de without without bait. Yeah. The, the key spots to see them are the, the offshore reefs. So the, the Red Sea is kind of a, is a baby ocean. It's, rel it's very deep in the middle, but very narrow. Yep. Um, and it's one day it's going to begin to open up and create a whole ocean basin. Um, most of the reefs are right fringing along the coast, and then very quickly the water drops very deeply. In a few places, there have been you know chunks of rock left behind um, as the ocean has spread, begin to spread, and those have become colonized with coral and created offshore reef environments. And it's around those offshore reef environments, sometimes around islands, sometimes around submerged reefs, that you tend to encounter oceanics. And the typical season that is good for them is kind of late summer through to the end of the year. But I have to say, in recent years, they've seemed to be more reliable through more of the year, which is is, is good news. So, so um, just just to point out, because obviously that would be European summer. So, so month wise, we're talking sort of yeah. August through to November, December. Um, yeah, yeah, the Red Sea summer as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it's um yeah. So, so the kind of the, the prime popular sites are the Brothers Islands, which are two small islands, Little Brother and Big Brother. Particularly Little, Little Brother is really favoured for oceanic white tip encounters. Um, Elphinstone Reef, which yep. is a lot closer into shore from the others and can actually be accessed by day boats as well. Yep. All, all the others are liverboard only. Yep. Um, Rocky Island down in the south of Egypt. Yep. I've had very, very good oceanic white tip um, activity down there. Yeah. And um, also um, Daedalus, um, which is an island and, and, and reef, um, a little in between kind of Elphinstone and, and Rocky Island. So and all those three give opportunities for oceanics. Geographically, just to put everyone in, in the picture, that, that obviously what we have is we have a stretch of, of the Egyptian Red Sea heading south towards the Sudanese border. And certainly some of these islands are getting down and approaching the Sudanese border. So, so we're talking mm -hmm. sort of southern extremities of the Egyptian Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sorry. And they've been reasonably well protected in, in Egypt, certainly from fishing yeah. there. Yeah. Um, the Egyptian locals always say that the risk to them are, are Yemeni boats coming up and fishing for them. I don't know how much of that is. It's all his fault or, you know, compared to truth. But the population is, is relatively stable there. It's generally, when you see it, it's a younger population. Right. There aren't really, re oceanic should grow to about three meters. It's rare to see one that's that big in Egypt. Right. Um, it may be that they are more offshore, and it's the youngsters that tend to come in closer to the reefs. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and another thing, actually, if you want to get a good historical perspective on how numerous oceanic white tips were, if you watch Jacques Cousteau's original um, um, film, um, Silent Sil World Silent film, World, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in that they, they have a whale carcass. Yeah. Um, uh, they, I think they hit it. Their, their boat, or I don't. Yeah, they ran it. They ran over. It was a baby whale. They they tried to strap it to the mm. front of the boat to try and keep it yeah, alive. And, and the oceanics turn up in huge numbers to feed on it. I do. So they proceed to shoot. Start shooting with the gun, don't they? <laughs> yeah. As Cousteau would. But, yeah. Um, yeah, different times. Um, but it's yeah, and, and Cousteau certainly talked about them as being the most dangerous of all sharks. Yeah. But I, I mean, given his you know love of, of superlatives aside, it's I think it was very much. For him, the fact that they're such a confident shark, they're very different from other sharks. Yeah. And that's what I would take out of what he says. Yeah. You know, they do swim up and, 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 and investigate you, particularly if you're on the surface. Um, and they are a shark that deserves a lot of respect. You know, and if you go and dive with them in someone like the Red Sea, the dive guys will give you a lot of detailed information about how you need to behave. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think I think um, Cousteau referred to them as the wolves of the sea, um, which which because he, I mean, in those days certainly the idea was they hunted in packs. You know, it was all it was all a bit kind of um, scary stuff. But uh, um, certainly certainly they're one of the few sharks that 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 when when they approach you, they're one of those sharks that you actually they command your attention in a, in a very um, in a very penetrating way, you know, you know exactly, and you, you know, you, you're not going to look away while they're coming your way. Um, yeah, yeah. So the way we, we know, typically shoot them in the Red Sea is they, they, they hang out relatively close to the surface, yeah. cruising in open water from the reefs. And the typical way that most dive guides try and see them is to do a normal dive on the reef, enjoy diving on the beautiful reefs that they're on, and then towards the end of the dive, come up and make safety stops out in the blue. Mm. 
And one of the best places to hang out is actually beneath the boats because the way they tie the boats to the reefs there is the wind is very consistent in the Red Sea. So they tend to moor, put a mooring line front and bow and stern on the boat to the reef and then just let the wind blow the boat off the reef. Yep. And that way the boat on the lee side of the reef and it stays out in the blue. Yep. And diving underneath the liverboards is a great way. And I was going to show you some pictures and actually um, the vertical one here, if you pull it up for a yep. sec. Yep. Um, this one here, actually the, the black shadow on the top of this is the boat. <laughs> and one of the reasons I showed this picture was to say that if you want to find oceanics in the Red Sea, dive under the boat yeah. when you're on the, these things. And it's, it gives you a good point of reference out in the blue. Yeah. You don't want to be drifting off way out in the blue in this situation. It's yeah. The Red Sea is big. Um, it's usually quite windy in the Red Sea on the offshore reefs, yeah. which means the sea is quite lumpy. And the one place you don't want to be with an oceanic is on the surface. And so you really want to stay with the boats. You don't want to be drifting off in the blue and then trying to get picked up in a lumpy sea where you might not be that easy to spot. And certainly I know plenty of divers who've had, um, you know, some pretty hairy encounters by not coming up where they should do. Yeah. So the key thing is to, is to go away from the reef, but you don't need to go far from the reef. I've got loads of shots of oceanics with the reef in the background. Yeah. But because they're an oceanic shark, I tend to prefer to be with my back towards the reef shooting out into the blue. Yeah. Um, and this next shot I was going to show you, it's kind of a big scene shot. And this is kind of often that first view of them. Um, the oceanic is relatively small in this picture, but I like these small in the frame shots. Yeah, lovely. Because I think it gives you that feeling of the shark being part of this big ocean realm. Yeah. And so whenever I'm shooting them, I want this big blue black drop, and I want I like that feeling of space around them. And I, I love the I love the pilot fish in this shot, and I think that's something else. They're very much part of the part of the oceanic white tip thing, um, and and yeah. so be managing to actually get them in the right places. And I mean, obviously, having silhouetted them in this shot as well makes them especially beautiful. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah, and, and the pilot fish are definitely um, of the, this shot here is a more close shot yeah. of the of the oceanic, just on a sort of plain blue background. But there's tons of pilot fish on this shot. Yeah. Now on this particular day, this one's down at Rocky Island. Yeah. We had three or four sharks around us during the day, yeah. but the one we were all focusing our lenses on was the one with the pilot fish, because yeah, it's yeah. just a much more interesting picture. It's, it's, so, yeah. yeah. And sometimes they get so much pilot fish that it almost obscures the shark. Yeah, yeah. One thing I've learned with the pilot fish is don't shoot the sharks too close with the pilot fish, because what happens, tends to happen is the shark comes right up to you, the pilot fish often accelerate ahead and mass around you, and they also become quite messy because they're all going in different directions then. So they look better when the pilot fish are either further back on the shark or the shark is slightly further away. When the shark comes too close, the pilot fish will start going in different, looking like they're going in different directions and the picture looks a little bit messy. So that's an interesting question, Alex. What sort of lens choice possibly for this type of shot? Because given they're a bit further away, do you use something with a bit more, bit more yeah, reach? So I mean, the way I like to shoot them is uh, obviously I run a lot of workshops there and we spend, we go out there to shoot them and we spend several days usually on the sites trying to get encounters. Yeah. That way everyone in the group gets lots of encounters. Yeah. Um, there's not too much pressure on one dive to give all the, the best encounters. Yeah. And as a group, actually, it can work quite well out in the blue because you can also, you then give points of reference for each other. Yeah. So everyone can sort of find their way back to the boat, even if they maybe lose sight of it for a little bit as long as they're keeping other members of the group in, in, in sight. Yeah. Um, I think for me, lens-wise, when you've got those multiple dives, it's good to work through a few lenses. Right. But I think it's a mistake to maybe go too wide because although they will come right up to your dome port, when they do, they become all face yeah, and yeah. no body. They yeah, get yeah. very tactical. So for me, I like to use, if I, on a crop sensor SLR, picture here of the shark coming straight onto the camera. Yep. Um, this picture here is with the 1017 on a crop sensor SLR. Right, okay. And 17 end is really, really nice for, for them. Which defishes um, quite a lot anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah it yep. defishes it, but it's just a nice angle, stops the head getting too big and, yep. even when they're close. Yeah. Um, or alternatively on full frame, my favorite lens is the WACP. Yeah. Um, and I think WACP1 is a great angle for sharks. And, and this picture here of the, sh of, of the shark just, just turning with the sunbeams behind it. Beautiful, yeah. Oh, yeah. um, this picture here is um, that's WACP, and this next one, which actually got two in the frame, yeah. is is a WACP shot. This one was shot blind. Yeah. The shark was buzzing around me, and I just just held the camera up and just kept shot shooting. It. Um, it was quite a hairy, you know, few seconds with two sharks. They get a bit. You know, the more sharks are on, the less people, the more confident they become. Yeah. Um, and these two were giving me quite a hard time, but I managed to keep the, the shutter down. And it was just complete luck that this is uncropped, and I just managed to fluke getting the shark completely in the frame and getting a second shark in the frame as well. Just right. Um, 
right place, mm. right time. So when you are shooting blind with sharks, don't aim at the head of sharks. You see lots of pictures of sharks with the tail cut off. That's because the photographer was shooting blind, as you might have to do in high action times, but they were aiming the camera at the head of the shark. And when you do that, the shark is, the head is in the middle of the frame and the body goes off to the side and the tail gets cut off. If you aim the camera at the pectoral fin of the shark, fin, yeah. the midpoint of the shark, then your shark is much more evenly distributed across the picture. Yeah. And if you look at this picture, you'll see that the pectoral fin is right in the middle of the frame. Yeah. And that allowed me to get this fluky composition of, of having the shark completely in the picture. Yeah, it's great um, tip. Because they're relatively shallow, particularly late in the day, it can be really nice to get some beams in the background of the pictures. Um, and this, this final picture I was going to show you shows the shark with some pilot fish with some beams behind it. And um, this shot here, um, one thing that's difficult though is that the Red Sea is normally windy. So it's quite difficult to get really, really nice sunbeam effects in the Red Sea because it's nearly always windy and choppy on the surface. And that breaks um, sunbeams up. So yeah, you, you, you can get the sun and you can get nice effects, yep. but you don't tend to re regularly get really amazing sunbeams with yep. the oceanic, yep. unless you get really lucky with the conditions. Yep. Um, photographing is actually pretty easy to shoot. It's a big animal in the blue, yep. you know, you know, three o'clock, six, uh, three o'clock, nine o'clock strobes, yep. you know, take care of everything. Yep. If you're expecting the shark to be far away, strobes out wide. If you're expecting or setting up for it to be coming into the dome, strobes in tight. Yep. Um, obviously more power when they're far away, less when you're close. Yep. Um, generally, they're pretty. They're actually quite easy to shoot. Yep. Um, it's just giving yourself the opportunities to get those shots and doing so safely. I think returning, um, returning back to one of your earlier points, well, Alex, I think the blue water colour, I mean, that's certainly one of the Red Sea's trademarks, um, is this mm -hmm. is this family blue water. I should also point out it's one of Alex's trademarks, but but um but um but from <laughs> but the but the water colour itself, I mean I think it does really, really set off the, the sharks. Um yeah. yeah. And, and I think when I'm yeah, so the way I tend to approach it is I'll find my position in the group yeah. and being aware of the there's people over here and people over there and the sharks are over there, I'll say, right, I'm gonna take my pictures on these sort of angles. Yeah. Both, both left to right, but also up and down. Yeah. And I'll make sure I've dialed in really good shutter speeds to get exactly the blue I want. Yeah. And then I'll be strict with myself when the shark comes in and know that I want to keep working that angle. Yeah. And not, I'm not just going to track around and yeah, follow yeah. the shark. Yeah. If the shark is going to you know, come down from above onto me, which can be quite nice to get it in Snell's window, yeah. then I'm going to set up for that and set up for the shot. So yeah. key to getting good shots of them is to have that discipline not just track around everywhere and try and fix it up afterwards, yep. but actually, you know, plan a shot and then work that shot for that pass, the next couple of passes. And that, uh, that should speed for, for watercolour. I mean, that's obviously, that's somewhat outside of the scope of this, but I think that's a really useful point. Is at the moment you change the camera angle relative to the, to the surface, that, blue is going to change so so mm. the color of the blue is going to change so this is this shows i mean that's the that's the maybe the key thing here isn't it it's just to keep that 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 camera angle relative to the surface get the shot speed dialed in and just point in that direction and wait till the shark swims in the right place yep, yep yeah and then once you've got some shots with that sh technique that shot then go to another position and work that for a little bit yep. and some of them will work some of them won't work in terms of getting a good pass yeah but at least technically everything's bang on yep. when you get those shots yeah yeah I, I that that's 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 wonderful advice. I think that's probably good advice for shooting sharks in general. But but um, but certainly very much to sort of blue water shooting is um, is 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 great advice. Um, I believe that people can search for your pictures uh, via species, Alex, on on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just type in um, Longimanus, which is the the Latin name and also the German name for oceanics. Yep. Is a good one. Is a good search term to see more pictures of those. Yep. You'll see Bahamas shots in there as well. So I've shot them in the Bahamas. Um, but yeah, and there's, there's lots and lots of shots. Um, you know, generally each time I go, I try and not just do the same shots again, but try and try and find new and different angles or, or yeah. you know different ways of, of shooting them yeah no that's great so so if you go to amos.com um, and put longimanus um in yeah. the search term you'll see lots of, of alex's um, images of um of the um great white sharks but uh, sorry i shouldn't white tip sharks um thank you so much for sharing those with us alex and uh, for sharing your tips um yeah no worries i'd like to thank um aquatica 
um, for um, sponsoring this episode. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed it or you find it valuable, please give it a like uh, and please feel very free to share your tips, techniques and any discussion in the comment section below. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon.